case and still some people really don't get the picture. Kind of give us an overview about the biggest bank robbery in history. Uh, the biggest bank robbery in history. Boy, that sounds like a cue if I ever heard one. <laughs> <laughs> Especially since uh, I've written about that. Uh, most folks call it the Federal Reserve System. And uh, it is uh, the biggest bank robbery, the biggest fraud, the biggest scam, I suppose, in all history. Um, so what can I say about the Federal Reserve that uh, people really want to hear? That's the question. People don't want to hear about the Federal Reserve because they think, as I used to think at one time before I got into this, that all oh, that's all that banking stuff, it's technical terms, who cares about discount rates and all the this long words that they used to describe the various transactions. Who cares about that? As long as, uh, you know, I get my paycheck and I can buy things at the store and the prices are reasonable. I'm sure there are good people in the government taking care of all this for us, right? <laughs> well, that was my attitude then, and then I found out as I got into it, like so many illusions that we'll be talking about at the Red Pill Expo, which is all about seeing through illusions and facing reality. Like so many illusions, that was one of the biggest ones, and that is that the, the money system is not being taken care of by an agency of the federal government at all. It's being managed by a very, very private and powerful group. Uh, actually, the group is a, is a cartel. It's not a government agency at all. It goes to great lengths to look like a government agency. Uh, it um, you know uses the word federal in it and uh, everything and Federal Reserve. Well, there, it's not federal any more than Federal Express. Uh, it has no reserves to speak of. They call themselves a bank. It's not really a bank. It's a cartel of banks. So all the way from top to bottom, it's an illusion. And why should people care? Well, they should care because in the middle of every, almost every human transaction in the world today, there's this thing called money. You, in the old days, in the very old days, if you wanted to uh, have something that you did not make and you wanted to purchase it, you had no choice but to either work for it with your labor or swap something that you had already acquired or made yourself uh, for that. That's called uh, barter. Well, the invention of money, of course, was the big spring that allowed the economy to unwind and, and people to accomplish things and, and build a, a lifestyle and all of the the advantages that we enjoy is this money, the ability to, to exchange something other than the object you want to use. And so you look it up in the dictionary, you find out that the definition of money is a medium of exchange. And that tells you everything that really you need to know about money. It's, it's a medium that you can use to swap one thing for another. And that you can hang on, you can acquire that medium and stash it away someplace so you have a little reserve, like a little, uh, like you dammed up the water in the stream and you don't need to use it or let it all go through. You can save some of it and use it for later purchases. Well, now, if you imagine that money as a medium of exchange is in the middle, as it suggests, in the middle of every, almost every human exchange in the world, and that thing called money is manufactured by a private group of individuals with absolutely zero oversight, with absolutely zero political control over it, it's a mind-boggling thing because all they have to do is just carve out a little percent or half a percent or a quarter of a percent of every human transaction. And you can imagine what a, a wide river of gold that that is that flows into the private coffers of the people who can create money as they do. So it's a mind-boggling thing. Everything we do, we pay a little tribute to these people who control the money supply. And I'm here to repeat that it's not done by the government. It's done by a private group of banks. It's a group of competing banks or partially competing banks that came together back in 1910. And by 1913, they worked out the plan not to compete anymore, to form a cartel, sort of a monopoly among certain major competitors. They said, look, we don't, why, do, why should we compete? and batter each, batter each other to the ground with blood all over the battlefield and 
Paris and New York and Wall Street and so forth, competing with each other on interest rates and finding clients. Why don't we just all get together and divide up the markets and that way we can get higher profit margins without competition? And that's what they did. That was happening not just in banking, but all across all aspects of industry at the turn of the last century. So that's what happened. I'm taking too long perhaps to explain it, but I'm trying to emphasize the fact that every slice of every transaction we make with another human being, economically that is, a slice of that is going to these hidden manipulators that we had never dreamed even existed. And the little bite they take for their service, in some cases it's not really a service, but in many cases it is, but the bite they take is exorbitant because there is no, there's no competition allowed. So half of our, our purchasing power every generation or every two generations, half of our purchasing power is being consumed by this group. If you had uh, a dollar at the time the Federal Reserve was created in, in uh, 1913, today the purchasing power of that dollar in terms of what it could purchase in 1913 is less than three cents. Where did the other 97 cents go from your savings? It went to this cabal. It went to this group of bankers who went in partnership with the politicians. It's a very secret, <laughs> very complex thing, but that's where that money went. In other words, it's legalized plunder. It is the biggest bank robbery of all history. It is marvelous. At the crux of everything, it's money. It's all about money. It's all about who controls the money. Absolutely. And then the question is, is where does it go from here? You know, you talked about how the, the value of the dollar from 1913 till now has lost 97 to 98 percent of its value with that little percentage that is left, you know, with these international banking systems we see from, uh, you know, the IMF, the World Bank. Uh, where does the Federal Reserve go from here? Has it plundered all the money that it plans on taking or is there another end goal that it has in mind after it removes the rest of the value from the U.S. dollar? Well, the answer to that is uh, controversial. Different people have different answers to it, but since you asked me, I'll give you my answer to it. The way I see it is that, uh, no, they haven't reached the end because we still have an economy. People still have uh, savings, uh, although it's dwindling constantly. People still have homes, automobiles, they own things. Uh, although it's getting harder and harder and harder to do that, they still have a lot of private ownership out there. And these people want it all. I mean that literally, they want it all. They're not content until they get all of it. Now, it's a hard concept to accept. Uh, there's a tendency to say, ah, oh, I don't believe that. Why would they want it all? And when they've got so much of it, well, that's just the way it is. Uh, I think it was Rockefeller himself, somebody asked him uh, how much uh, money is enough, and he said, uh, I'll let you know, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's never enough, because it's not just the money. You see, the money is the path to power. It's the path to control. What money really, it's only value, since you can't eat it, uh, it's only value is in terms of what you can acquire with it. And uh, it, its value is that you use it to retain the products and services of other people. Now in the old days, that was if you had the right to claim all of the products and services of a per person, then that person was your slave. That was called servitude. And that slavery still hasn't disappeared from the world, uh, but in the old fashioned form, it's pretty rare. Yeah, there are still slaves in parts of the world, it's quite common. But in the Western world, it's frowned upon uh, to think that there would be such a thing as slavery. Well, if all of your output, all of your goods and services really flow to someone else, whether you like it or not, then you may not realize it or not, but you are literally a slave to that person. Now, as it turns out now, most of us are partial slaves. You know, it, it, at, how, at what point in the year do we stop working for uh, taxes and interest rates taxes to the government and interest rates to the banks. Well, it's somewhere between May and June. In other words, half of the half of our lives are now spent serving uh, other people that we don't even know their names. We don't know how it happens, but we are right now half enslaved and don't even know it. They want the other half. They want to go back to the good old days of the Roman Empire. 
They want to go back to the days when there were the there were the slaves and then the masters, and everybody understood uh, which side they were on. It was very simple. And if you were the master, that's the way you wanted to keep it. That's the answer. They want it all because it's not the money. They want the total control over the population. So where is this headed? Is the question. That's where they would like to see it go. And if we don't stop it, that is where it's going. And it's not going to happen, in my view, through the money. Believe it or not, I think the money is what gets us to the to the front door. But there will come a point when the the currencies. It's already happened in many cases. The currencies collapse. They don't buy anything anymore. And they can say, "Well, we got a new currency. Let's go to a new currency. Let's back this one a little bit with gold." Everybody says, "Oh, good, we got it backed by gold. This one will be a good currency." Then ten years later, they take the backing away, and it's gone right back to the same old fiat currencies we've always had. And then that currency collapses, and then the powers that be say, "Well, let's. We got a new currency now." And we, they keep replacing older, defunct currencies with newer currencies, which are also fiat, meaning they're not backed by anything. Except the political power to create them out of nothing and to force people to accept them, and so you go through this period of collapse, collapse of one currency, one system after another. Where does that go? Well, it doesn't take. You don't have to have to be a, a rocket scientist to figure out that when the money of the world is finally combined into one currency, and that's what they are working toward—a universal, international, one-world currency. And then, when that one collapses, there is no place else to go. It, at that point, everyone, everyone except that very small oligarchy at the top, everyone else will be dependent upon the state for food, shelter, employment, education, everything. Now, at that point, you don't need money. All you need is just little numbers or digits or. A different colored card that'll get you into a better restaurant, and you get assignments from the state of where you're going to live, and、uh, you get、uh, coupons for clothes you wear. You get、uh, maybe maybe we're talking about that chip that's going to be buried in your hand, and if you're a good boy and girl and you play by the rules and you don't cause any trouble, well you. You hold that chip up against the scanner. Oh, you can buy groceries with it. But if you're a troublemaker like I am, you hold that chip up, and it's ah,、uh-uh, no money, nothing. You can't buy anything. That's where we're headed, and that is that will be the do the new definition of slavery. It'll be economic slavery, and it not it will not necessarily involve money at all, but digitized units, which is another form of money. Okay.